so without further ado, uh, <laughs> I shall invite LOD uh, from the Tenma Federation Coordinator to take the So you have to be here. You can be anywhere you like. Then you, you know, we are, we are like that. <laughs> Hi everybody. Do you, do you want a microphone? Um, no, I'm okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. So, yes. It's a bit hostile sometimes, but you can like walk, walk along with <laughs> it and share. I, I, would, I would do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, so it is Tenma. We are founding Tenma in uh, September 2010 now. Uh, but it's actually a, a, a cooperative uh, led by refugee women from Birma. And uh, we are based on fair trade principles and cooperative, the cooperative model. So uh, the Tenma women are part of 35,000 Edenese women refugees here in Malaysia. Officially, altogether refugees from Birma, there are about 100,000. She lives from the United Nations here in Malaysia. But um, 3 million of them are in Thailand, uh, 100,000 of them in Australia, many refugees in the US. So the population of the relocated of uh, refugees, uh, people from Burma over the world, uh, about 4 million. Uh, so they have fled um, persecutions, they have fled violence, their basic human rights have been denied. Uh, the women we know have never been to many schools. So, um, so it's actually in 2008, we set up a pilot project uh, in one community refugee with the women, so I was just a volunteer with them, and, uh, and very, very, very fast, and 100 women just asked to come and attend our classes, English classes, meetings, sewing, um, some selling also, selling classes. Uh, but the most important part is they could uh, self-fund their own projects, so meaning that they could do handicrafts, make crafts, I will help them to sell, and from the benefit, they have decided to help other women or children to empower their own community because when they went through, they didn't want to other to go through. So that's a very, very brave and courageous and beautiful story. And uh, so in 2008, um, we started this one, one woman organization, but very, very fast. Other groups said, if the two men can do, we also can do. So we, we started to help other women organizations to come out and organize their work. And so it's how a Wuhan wife uh, is also part of the, the history of Tenma. Uh, she came a day and said, I can make soaps, I can share my skills with anyone. And uh, do you know anyone who would be interested? She said, yeah, why not the refugee women group? And from the benefit of the soaps, they can then run social projects. And now it's just these from soaps, they, they fund a shelter for families. Uh, it's an, a temporary shelter for women survivors, for example. Um, women where we rescue them from trafficking in the border. So it's very, very important. And they bring changes in their own community from about soap. So this tree, so the Tanma, the Tanma Cooperative, uh, was formed by three refugee women organizations, Manta, Cow Pride, two women organizations, and now there are 77 women artisans who get salary, monthly incomes with us, and 200 women every year will attend our employment program. We found a shelter, we found a school for 140 children from the flats, from the soaps. Um, I will give you all the details and in the brochure. And they also, um, run an empowerment women center. Everything from the craft daily. So for all the women, it's the first time they get an income, so they empower themselves financially. They make some changes at home. That's, that's, yeah, that's very, very important. But they also fund social projects to empower their own community. And they learn social entrepreneurship skills with us. So when they go to US, when they go to Australia, then they can actually small, start with small businesses. Because they are here in Malaysia as refugees, so protected by the United Nations, but they are not allowed to stay here. They have no right to work. So they are all waiting to get resettlement to a third country. 
but the process can take years, so the children grow and still need to go to school. Or they still need to feed their families. If they get sick, they still need to go to the hospital. But without the right to work, without the right to have money or to earn money, because you just can't survive. So we recognize the right to livelihoods, so it's why we still uh, organize income generation activities, and the benefit is for no pocket, everything goes back to the community. The women decide what to afford, regarding the priorities, emergency. So these two women organizations, they, they came to the vital point, uh, sorry, the necessary point to sustain all their projects by being under a central organization. So they share funds, they share the volunteers, they share the equipment, they share resources, whatever resources they have, and, and then they can sustain all their projects. So for any selling opportunities, if there is one group having a selling opportunity, they will share it with the other groups. And so this federation actually tried to develop and provide marketing, selling opportunities for all these women to go and sell. On the 77 women, 25 are sellers and get wages for going to sell. And, um, and so when they start with us, it's a one-year program empowerment. They start from EBC. Women, they don't know how to write, how to read. They, sit, they start the school at 11, at 12, some of them in. So we start with ABC, with night study class, intense class. And at the end of the year, they, are, they learn everything about social entrepreneurship skills and go to shops, selling their crafts. Go into a shop and say, can you sell this craft? We sell you this price, you can sell double. You make your own benefit, but us, we can find our school for my children. So it's very powerful. So this, uh, actually, it's, um, we, we have developed this model within a year. And, uh, and we already could see that from our artisan, 77, 10 are now social entrepreneurs. So it's a success. We need to improve this model, of course. But they go through leadership training. They go through uh, marketing, selling trainings, uh, business tips, negotiation. Uh, but also conflict management, peace building, human rights, and gender. Yeah, that's really good. Because they address a message. When they go to a community and share about what they do, they are doing it. So in, in, in it's very, very traditional society. The Burmese society is very traditional, very patriarchal. The women can't come up. So it's how we communicate. Um, it's how we bring changes also in the traditional system. And when we go against practices, traditional practices, we really need to be careful and, of course, to educate, raise awareness. So because to empower women financially can bring some changes at home, yes, but not only positive, we, we had to address the gender issues. So we, we, formed, uh, we created another program in the co-op. We call it gender, gender program. And so women and men together have been trained on uh, the gender issues, um, but in, in other, actually, uh, uh, other issues. And they've created their own tools to go into communities and address these issues. I mean, to create spaces, create spaces for questions to rise up. And then just facilitate discussions. And so they use drama. They use music and share a message. Um, they use flash action, actions. They go into a community, suddenly they all have the same t-shirt and sing something and go. That's what they do. And, um, and we could find, we could see actually some, some uh, very positive reactions, especially from the youth, um, with boys saying like, oh my god, we maybe need to start to change our mind because our community is not healthy at all. 80% of the women in our community is victim of homelessness. violence. 80%. So it's, it's critical, definitely. Uh, in Myanmar, it's about, in Myanmar, it's about the same, same level. And um, we know how women and children are connected. So we're talking about future. And when it's a painful community, it's just drawing. It's just not drawing in any direction at all. The child needs, doesn't get the affection it needs to grow. The family can grow. 
to know for sure. So it's, uh, it's what the women say, but it's also what they say behind the, behind the product. So, so it's not only about a product, it's about a story. It's about the women refugees, where they're from. And they also call for social justice, for their families in Burma. They dream about going back or to see again their mother before their mother passed away, I remember. That is their dream. Or their grand grandchildren to see their grandparents. Simple dream, but, but not accessible for all. And they also talk about the plight of the refugees here. Because in Malaysia, they are considered as illegal, illegal immigrants. Um, meaning that the Malaysian government did not sign the convention, refugee convention. So refugee status doesn't exist here. So they have no right to walk in the street, no right to be here. And so they are empty. And uh, a crime started, has started a few months ago now, since November. Meaning that the Malaysian government, immigration police and RELA, organized operation, operation everywhere, everywhere in the country, arrest hundreds of people, put them in the van, and send them to, depor to deportation, send them to detention camp, and then deportation happens. So since November, the immigration gave that number, 94,600 refugees have been deported. And all these refugees are from Afghanistan, Iraq, Burma, Burma um, Syria, Lebanon. All conflicts, all war uh, countries in, in, in war. So it's alarming, it's really warning, there is no covering coverage in media. So uh, NGOs try to watch, to monitor. Uh, and uh, when here there is an operation, operation happening in, in Kuala Lumpur, in Penang or whatever, it's to tell us, to give us the information, and then we track where the people who in the state. Where are they going? Where are they going to? And are they going to be deported? And someone deported in Burma, 20 years jail. 20 years. Um, when they are deported, they actually ask at the airport to the to the refugees to pay first, to pay money. Yeah. And the amount uh, asked by the immigration and the airport is about the flight ticket cost. If you can pay, then you just go out you just go out from the airport. If you can't pay, then you are arrested. And of course they have no money on them because before to get to be sent back, they just had spent months in immig immigration camp without anything on them. So they are arrested. <coughs> Uh, it's very important to, to watch and to spread the message and uh, actually to give our support to the refugee community in Malaysia. Can you imagine the fear of being arrested? It's every day. Our, um, our women organize uh, layers for their children in the school. In case of operation, we can hide themselves and do it. Check a wall. And it's, it's right here. It's like 10 minutes away from here, and there are 110,000. So it's definitely a very dark reality. People without any options, people without any rights, and they still stand up, organize themselves, and empower others. Yeah, I don't know how they get this strength from, but actually, it's about dignity and survival. And just to give our support, just to talk about them, it's the minimum. Family questions. <laughs> Thank you, Elodie. Take a question, take a question. Um, what do you need help with? So we already help. Let's just be proactive about it. It's a very sad story. I'm actually also quite. Uh, involved in the refugee things, I'm, I'm, I've been trying to help as well. But like you say, it's a very interesting problem because they are technically illegal here. Uh, even though if you're, pro if, if you're, if you're a non-profit and you want to help them, it's illegal to help them because technically they're not supposed to be here. Yeah. I would so, be interested to know, learn, like, what, what can we do 
uh, at different levels you can at different levels yeah just, yeah, just yeah. give some so ideas. of course it's very important to show the support to them saying that it's not your fault it's not uh, the government is not right to hunt you and to send you back okay uh, they need support from the Malaysian civil society and it's very difficult for us to actually reach the Malaysian people it's very hard and we can see within our volunteers very very few are locals very few Many of our volunteers are from Germany, America, France, UK, but not Malaysian. So we, we need to create that feeling of, we have to do something that's not normal. What is happening here, we should not close our eyes. We should react. It's about social justice. I don't want that for my children. I don't want that for my sister. And, and I believe in one community. I believe about abilities. I believe that everybody, if you want to really grow, if you really want rights for everybody and peace, we, we, should, we should take care of every one of us as one. That's, uh, I believe in that. So yes, pray around us, it's support them. And actually, one best way to support the, the women who are up is really to look for selling opportunities. Because as I said, from the benefit, they find school, they found a shelter, they found a, um, a women empowerment center, and they know how to help their people. And an emergency fund also, and after detention, uh, we help minors and uh, women. Uh, then we are, we are always looking for drivers to, as volunteers also to go, to, to go for sale, to drive their things, and English teachers and some selling advice and you know marketing advice we have no marketing for example <laughs> but uh, still we are 77 now uh, having their salary so i'm sure we can do so much better and um, and empower more women that's uh, that's our dream okay. um one more question anybody got any questions for them yes Sally. Uh, just out of curiosity is there any program that allows these uh, refugees to transfer to a country that gives them the refugee status. Because um, my logic in asking that question is, at the end of the day, the government does not recognize refugees in this country. So in the long term, in terms of especially the children, when they grow up, um, we provide them education here, support. They, they still can't get a job. They still um, won't have status. <coughs> so in the long term, is there any program? So, yeah. Yeah, that uh, can transfer them from Malaysia to a country where they can actually get refugee status and thereby mm -hmm. become part of that, that country. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first, yes, Malaysian government doesn't recognize that. Yes. that exists. Okay, uh, for many reasons, because they say there are no refugees from Myanmar, from Myanmar since Malaysia has supported the junta in Myanmar, so they cannot say now, yeah, yes, there are refugees. So. Um, then yes, there is a program. It's not only a program; it's uh, United Nations. We actually recognize uh, refugees and uh, register them as asylum seekers once they are in Malaysia, and then work with governments, American government, Australian government, Swedish, no Norway, um, big UK, and Republic Czech to actually welcome uh, refugees by by quota. Right. So it's about. 10% of the refugee community getting a chance to get visited to a third country, and it takes years. Then, uh, refugee children have no access to education in Malaysia. Yes. So they are not allowed to go to, to government school. So communities organize their own refugee school. But it's still only 50% of refugee kids go into the school. 50% of them are not access to education. Um, I have a question related to what you just said because I was I was involved in uh, coordinating workshops for children that are uh, from refugees for more than two years with some volunteers from here as well. But like since uh, November, um, late late November, December, that the laws from Malaysia got very tough with them. We haven't been able to give the workshops anymore. So I was wondering, like, what else? Like volunteers that aim to go and teach them about arts, about like self-expression, about English, how they can like interact with the communities, like go directly to them because they, the community that we, we were working, they are situated in Bukit uh, 
they are very scared. They are very scared that they are going to be detained, as I yeah. told you the, the other time. So I would like to know, like, how the children still can be integrated in a society, in, in a society like this, because they are going to be here for many years. Sometimes they take, they are even like 10, 15 years old, they are still here, and they are not speaking English, but how people can, like, interact, help them? Yeah, it's actually a recent year, since November. Um, refugee schools also face high level of um, arrest, um, of, of operation, um, especially in some areas. So it's why uh, schools um, uh, change a bit. I'm not going to say everything. <laughs> um, but yes, in some areas, uh, the schools are not opening anymore. Uh, because it's just too dangerous. Yeah. So they 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 have uh, small schools in uh, other places, and uh, we can talk later about it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So it's, 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 it is a tough problem to solve. It's a very big problem. It's a very very big problem, and um, and we need the um, the international community attention. Yes, we need to make sure. estimation of the size of the problem. How many refugees are there in Malaysia? 110,000. 110,000. That's women, children. Yeah, and together. Ninety percent of them are from from Burma, from Myanmar. Ninety percent. Thirty-five are women. Thirty-five thousand women. Twenty-five thousand. Yes. Can you get media interest on this? Um, yeah, we try, we try, but it's not easy. We don't really get all the attention we should get. Uh, we never talk about the human rights issues in Malaysia, right? We talk about trade and economical development, not about the human rights issues. So we, it's important to call the government to sign the refugee convention uh, because then we are able to, to protect their rights, to claim their rights, to assert them and own them. And so uh, if we can create then spaces uh, where we could go to court and, you know, and call for justice. Sorry, um, because there's, there's two types of media, I mean, the normal, the star media, and also the alternative media. Yeah. 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 Malaysia Kini, Malaysia yeah, yeah, Insider. Yeah, yeah. So I think they do report. Yeah, we, yeah, they, they do report, report what they can. We do work <coughs> very closely with them, not a uh, But uh, some documentaries uh, also have been yeah. big done by Australian, uh, Australian media, uh, CBS, Al Jazeera came. Um, CNN also came, but regarding the program coming in April, we, we need to give evidence, proofs, uh, photos, we have to really show that yes, that happens, and to mainstream those information that outside. Yeah. If we could get more attention, that would help for sure. <coughs> okay, thank you very much, Elodie. Thank you. Uh, we will stay in touch.